Hey guys, I'm Sebastian, Moonlight Matters. Um, I'm gonna take you, I'm gonna walk you through a new track I'm working on for a new project called Arches with my friend Jochen from Sound of Stereo and Gustav from Herpes and Love Affair. Um, it's a track that's gonna be out on Columbia Sony uh, anytime soon, so uh, let me walk you through it. Um, for this track, the whole basic idea came from uh, an a cappella that uh, Jochen sent me one day and he was like, yeah, I really love this folk, we have to do something with it. Um, the acapella is by Diana Ross, the really famous singer, um, which is really nice because you start off with a really good voice, but in the end, if you want to get everything cleared and stuff, um, it can uh, prove to be quite a complicated process. So therefore, instead of using the original acapella, uh, we opted for someone else to sing it. And because we transposed the original a cappella and the new vocals we record, they sound almost similar. So um, maybe what I should do is play you a piece of the original a cappella first. We transposed it three semi notes, so the original must have sound somewhere like this. When you transpose it three notes, you get to this. So what we did to uh, record the original vocals is um, we recorded at the original pitch and then uh, pitched it afterwards, just the exact same like we did on the with the original a cappella. Um, so. Once you start a track with an a cappella, uh, and especially a good one like this, most of the song is already there. Um, it's just a matter of building around the vocal and within your style, knowing what uh, the vocal is asking for. Um, since our project is more like a deep project, that's the kind of approach uh, we took as well. Um, for recording the vocals, um, it was done by a really great singer, Billy Kawendi, who um, double tracked everything because when I record vocals I double or even triple track everything so it's a pretty hard job to match everything up but the result is there uh, there are two reasons for that um, I can control the whole panning uh, better and the second thing is if you record something twice or three times you get like a natural chorus effect uh, which is really nice addition uh, to recording a vocal so um, as you can see uh, there are fairly, fairly some uh, layers here of vocals. These are all different harmonies and different octaves. So um, it might sound like a simple vocal, but it's built up out of uh, quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of layers. Um, all the vocal cuts were done in the original a cappella, um, and then. Um, um, replaced or redone uh, for for the, the new vocals we recorded. Um, so maybe I should start uh, with a piece in the song where the vocal drops in, just uh, to give you an idea of what, how it sounds like. Okay, so let me tell you just a little bit about the vocal treatments. It's all pretty straightforward. Um, I've got an insert reverb coming from Native Instruments Guitar Rig, which is uh, a part of the whole complete package I bought, which is a great investment. Um, I've got the twin delay on there and the octave verb, pretty straightforward, simple stuff. Um, you've got a lot of uh, uh, things you can adjust on the reverb, uh, so it's pretty easy to, to sculpt it into the right thing. Then another thing I have on there is a send return reverb. Uh, that's more of a reverb I use to route different things of the track through, just to make sure everything of the track is in the same space, because when you use different reverbs it can create a spatial uh, uh, weird thing um, so everything is in, in the same place. Um, next to that I've got an SSL 
uh, channel on there, the Waves SSL channel on there, which is my uh, preferred channel strip because uh, it, it was used on a lot of hit records, obviously the real table um, back in the days. And since I'm more into the retro sounds, uh, it's really nice. You have uh, the whole EQ section on there, uh, the filter section on there, um, the compressor and the um, expander on there, and then just the volume fader and input uh, input volume. So it's really nice. Uh, I tend to use it on every channel. Um, the only thing I use a different EQ for is when I really have to go surgically. Uh, you might want to use uh, like uh, something that has a little more bands than three and has smaller curves and stuff like that. But just for the basic EQing, this is a really musical uh, EQ to my ears. Next to that, I've got a small uh, Cubase reverb on that that I just use in the breaks just to give the vocal a little bit more space. Um, after that, to clear up the vocals and give it a little bit more shine, I've got the TC Electronics Master X3 on there because it tends, it tends to bring up the higher harmonies of a vocal really good, so that's why I got it on there. And after that, I have a limiter. I use the Sonoxys uh, Max Limit on there. Uh, it's pretty heavy limited, limited this one, um, but I use it because um, I tend to prefer it over the waves uh, limiters, but that's just a per personal uh, personal taste, I guess. Um, so that's uh, the vocal treatment. Uh, once we had the vocals, um, I started with finding chords uh, on the piano. Um, it's really easy because afterwards um, you have the writing there and you can uh, really uh, concentrate on just uh, picking the right sounds. Um, so after finding the chords on the piano, um, I changed the chord sounds uh, to one of my Omega 8 Studio Electronics Omega 8 presets. Uh, really, really nice synth and uh, I found some really lush chords for it. Um, there's a slow LFO on both oscillators, different LFO to make them uh, kind of like mimic the drifting of a, of a really old uh, synth that hasn't been calibrated in a while which resulted in uh, this sound. You can hear the sound is alive. It's not a sterile uh, sound, first of all because of it's an analog synth, and second of all because of the programming of the LFO. What I used to make the chords a little wider, to make them fit in the mix better, is the Waves Mondo Mod. Um, uh, I have it set up um, on a setting where um, on the whole 360 square uh, field it goes around really really quick. So actually it's it hasn't been panned wide, it's just something going really quick from left to right mimicking some kind of white uh, panned, uh, panned pad. Uh, next to that I have the PSP Vintage Warmer on there. Um, which is uh, a sort of um, analog um, compressing kind of tool, which also kind of like, uh, it, it almost sounds like you would record something through tape. Uh, it's a really simple plugin, uh, but really useful that I use on a lot of stuff. Um, then I have the SSL channel on there again, uh, and the Sonoxys limiter just to top it off. Just a little bit of reverb from the send return reverb, just to get it in the same space again. Um, if we're moving on to probably the second most important part of the song is the bass line. Um, it's this kind of uh, bass that has enough sub, so you don't have to layer an extra sub under there, but still is really well represented in the mid-range. Um, just to get the, the, the punch of the, of the bass there. It's a patch I used from my Andromeda uh, Alesis, uh, Alesis uh, Andromeda, and I call it the sexy bass, and this is how it sounds like. So that's for the long notes. Once you get to the short notes, it sounds a little more snappy.
So again, really well represented uh, through the whole uh, frequency spectrum and then equalized to fit with the kick, of course. Uh, it's always good to make space in something or the baseline or the kick and uh, take out some certain frequencies that you boost in something else so they become complementary frequency-wise. Um, the way I've treated the bass is I've added a discord on it, which is like... Uh, uh, a plugin you can use for delay or to widen stuff up. Uh, after that, I've got the vintage warmer again. The SSL channel is on there. There's a, a simple delay on there. And then again, a small limiter just uh, to avoid clipping on, uh, on channels. Uh, a little, little of that send, return, reverb again, just to get it in uh, the same space. So now we've got the vocals, the bass and the pads. Um, once we had that, I added a small string sound on top that comes from a sample tank. Uh, I've got some really nice uh, string samples in there that not too many people use. Um, and if you use them the right way, they sound really realistic. On this track, they don't really sound realistic, but that wasn't the thing I was going for. But just to give you an idea, this is one note. This is one, one note, it's under a filter now, so coming up and then going into chords um, for, for the kind of break. They don't sound like real strings but here, but then again, that, that's not what I was, was uh, going for. So we've had the bass, the pads and the strings. Um, what what else is in there that's really important? Uh, um, I've got some sweeps. Um, I've been a sinner and I've took them from the Vengeance sample pack, so guilty as charged. Some of them I've made myself, but uh, if they work, why not? I mean, uh, you have to do best of both worlds. You have to do analog, digital. You have to be able to use a loop in a in a good way in a creative way or make your own drum patterns. I think uh, you once you start excluding stuff, you will only limit your point of view towards music. So try all that stuff yourself. Um, one thing that's also worth mentioning is that for most of the drums, I'm using Reason, rewired in uh, Cubase. Uh, the reason for that is um, it's one of the programs I've been used to working with for a long time, even before I bought all analog gear and all other stuff. And it's really stuck with me and it really taught me how to work in a studio environment. Though it's all virtual, you have the cables there, you have the CV, the gate, the splitters, everything is there. So if you want to learn about real studio patching, I think Reason is a, is a fairly good uh, way to, to go. So, um, as you can see, I'm using almost every available instrument of the basic instruments in Reason. I'm using the NNXT sampler uh, that was for the strings we heard earlier. Uh, I'm also using the Dr. Rex just for loops. Uh, it's a really easy tool to uh, import loops in and then rearrange them completely just in two or three minutes. So that's really easy to do. And then next to that, I also use the Red Drum. Um, I really love the Red Drum because it's an 808-909 interface um, style uh, programming. Uh, so that's, that's really hands-on and most people can work with that in, in less than 10 minutes. Uh, another good feature on there for me personally is the swing function. Uh, and actually the whole groove thing in Reason is a really nice tool. Uh, if you just uh, if you don't want to go straight on the grid, you know uh, it can be interesting for some music styles. It's interesting to go on the grid, and for some music styles, it's more interesting not to do it or even do it in a verse and change it up in the chorus. It can add a lot to the whole uh, feel of the of the whole track. Um, it's also uh, very easy to automate stuff in. Uh, you don't have to route a lot of stuff, or you just uh, click record, turn the button, and there you have your automation. So. Uh, Time-wise, it's a it's a really good uh, it's a really good tool to work with as well. Um, to give you a quick example of uh, what's coming out of Reason for this track, um, I've got um, some percussion. I've got a Lindrum kick that I've layered with a 909 kick. 
Uh, let me check out, uh, probably can hear it here. So that's the Lin kick and some percussion. Uh, if I'm correct, this is the 909 kick. Adding a lot more thumb to the whole thing. The 909 is for the bass segment, the linearm kick is more for the mid. Um, just to have a kick that is present in the whole spectrum and uh, it's not going to be masked too much by other instruments and uh, so if I'm correct uh, there must be a snare or a clap as well here somewhere uh, these are just some hi-hats coming from Reason as well 909 stuff uh, the rim shot coming from Reason as well um, so that's the basic stuff coming out of Reason for this. And then uh, on top of that, um, I added some loops. Um, not too many, just a few. Um, here you go, here you have the clap. And then just a small fill. So that's basically all the drums on the track. So, kick, uh, both kicks uh, from Reason, some percussion just laid with some loops, uh, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, again, uh, Reason is a really nice tool just to, to make uh, stuff quick and to get your ideas going and uh, that's, uh, that's mainly uh, what I use it for. Um, some other stuff I can maybe say is that I'm working with a Sonic Core a Scope card, which is a DSP audio card. Um, apart from it being, uh, it, apart from it delivering DSP power like the UAD, it's also an audio card. So uh, the advantage of that is that you can just wire a whole bunch of stuff. It's actually a modular setup, which means you can uh, route live things through plugin. Uh, um, effects and stuff like that uh, you, you you can think of it and you can do it with this audio card um, it's getting a little bit out of outdated right now but uh, I have to admit for me it's still the heart of my studio uh, like my whole master chain is on here as well I use uh, a compressor called Vinco S which is like a reproduction of the 1176 by Ure, uh, Ure. And uh, I also use the OptiMaster plugin, which is a native plugin from the platform um, that gives you a lot of control over your master chain. Actually, you have a normalizer, expander, compressor, and limiter on there, and they're all multiband. So that's a really, really uh, interesting tool um, to uh, to finish up uh, your mix. Um, I also on my master chain. Most of the time start with the small compression, do the, do the basic mix on there and then go to the master chain and then tweak the mix in according to what's on the master chain and tweak the master chain in according to how the mix is. So these go both hand in hand. Uh, the reason why I start with a small compressor on the master mix is because it tends to glue stuff together from the start. and. Um, you, you also are going to make a different mix if you start without it and then add the compressor rather than starting to mix through the compressor. Uh, because when you do a mix through the compressor and you switch it off, it can sound completely different. So, you know, that's the reason why it's, it's already on there uh, for me. So, um, that's, that's for the, compressing, the compressor on the Sonic Core card, which is my master chain. If you go back to Cubase and you look at my routings, um, here you can see I don't have one master bus, but, but I have 16. Um, the reason for that is that I can gain much more control over the different elements and route them uh, to the Sonic or mixer. I also do my ducking on here, some NDQ um, and some plugins I really like that are not available in, uh, in Cubase. So that way I, I have 16 master outs and it might be um, a mental thing, but for some reason, uh, having 16 masters uh, summed in the Sonic Core sounds better than having everything summed in Cubase. I don't know if it's true, it can be personal, but for me, that's, that's how I feel about it. Um, so that's the basic setup, reason rewiring Cubase. Cubase wiring it to the Sonic Core. 
and then the sonic gore goes out to my Roland mixer, which is actually just a monitor uh, mixer. So I don't use it to mix or anything. Uh, and that's basically my mixing chain. The big desk that's over here, uh, the Tascam M600, is, is actually here as a summing mixer. So I don't use it to mix. It's just a mixer to send everything through and have analog summing and have, have everything glued together like that. So that's my basic uh, recording chain. For the vocals, we use the TLM 105 mic, which has the same cell, if I'm correct, as the U78, uh, which is a legendary mic. The only difference is you don't have all the different polar patterns, uh, but you have the, the right polar pattern to record vocals which is, and close-up uh, instruments, which is my main, uh, my main uh, chunk of things that have to be recorded. So from the TLM 105, I go into a relatively cheap preamp from TL Audio. Uh, we have to check the type again. It's the VP5051. Um, it's relatively cheap, though it has valves in there. Uh, you can pick it up second hand for 300 euros, 350 euros. Um, just to say that you don't need all the most expensive stuff to, to be able to record good vocals, you know. The main thing is to uh, get you, all your sources as clear as possible in the computer. Unless you really know what you're doing, you can add already EQ and compression. But for me, uh, the best way to work is to get everything in the computer as clear as possible. So I have the, the wide variety of possibilities to add to color, to EQ, to compress everything after I captured it. Um, so that's, uh, that's, the main, that's the main recording process and that's how I record the vocals for this track. So I think we've had all the elements. Um, next to that, um, building a song isn't just about all the sonic stuff. It's also, you know, about feeling and changing arrangements, trying to be more efficient uh, in, in all kinds of stuff. Like for this uh, song, I, I also made a radio edit. I think the original is close to five minutes and we went to under three minutes. Um, so that's a good lesson as well. Like if you're making a long track, and you're trying to edit because there is always going to be a point where you're starting to edit, try to think of a radio edit. What is really important in the track? Uh, what, is, uh, what is unmissable? What is unexpendable in the whole track? And try to give that a prominent role in, in uh, the whole thing. For instance, for the, for the long version of this track, uh, the chorus kicks in with a vocal loop. Um, let me play that to you right now. So this is a great part of the song. It's really dancey. It's going to work on a dance floor. It get, gets people in the groove. But then again, on a radio edit, you want to get all the most important information up front. So, for example, if we go, uh, if we go to the the part where the chorus drops in the radio edit, the loop isn't there, and instead you get the full vocal. So. So I guess the most important thing to say about this is at a certain point in the track you get to the point where you have to kill your darlings and that's probably one of the most important things of making a song, uh, trying to cut out stuff that's, that's not, uh, not needed, that's not relevant to the song. So uh, here you go, I hope you enjoyed it, it's been a small tour uh, around this uh, track and uh, I hope uh, you got something out of it, you heard something you haven't heard before or you you get inspired to do different stuff than you usually do. Hello, I'm Savant. Catch me next week in the studio with Future Music.